these tests are then sent to an outside vendor for grading and results are given. And does that ensure that uh, you're both proficient uh, in your expertise um, and used to, I guess, grade your performance? Jackson yes. Lee then. Oh. Now you're a senior forensic scientist? Correct. And what is a senior forensic scientist, I guess, different uh, as a difference uh, in a regular forensic scientist? Um, I am able to serve as point of contact as a technical leader or as a supervisor um, in our unit. Um, I'm also, I also mentor interns during the summer when they come in and assist with training of the analyst. You used a couple of terms that I would like you to explain. Uh, first of all, what is serology? Serology is the identification of biological materials such as blood or semen. So what does that mean? Break that down for us. Identification of biological fluids, how or on what? Um, we look at biological materials on any item of evidence. Um, we have presumptive tests and we have confirmatory tests to confirm the presence of those materials. And what are the ways that various materials come to you in the lab for you to perform serological analysis? Um, they come with evidence seals, um, one in the chain of custody or a property receipt. And what I mean is, do they come in the form sometimes of swabs? Yes. Um, do you also receive sometimes actual items of evidence, be it clothing or objects, things like that? Yes, we do. Now, when you're performing a serological analysis, uh, what are the steps that you take in order to determine whether or not an item may contain uh, a biological fluid, such as a blood, semen, or um, touch? For our presumptive testing, uh, we have a color change test. Um, we take a, a cutting of an item or a swab, whatever item that is, fill with those chemicals on that item. Uh, for example, if it is a, a blood stain, um, that item will turn a pink color if it is positive. Um, if it is negative, there will be no color change. That's our presumptive test for blood. Uh, for our confirmatory test for blood, we take a, a small cutting of that item, um, place it into a liquid solution. And we take that solution and place it onto a cartridge. If one line appears that is negative for the presence of blood, and if two lines appear, it is positive for the presence of uh, human blood. If any of the presumptive or confirmatory tests that you uh, that you perform on an item of evidence, does it destroy, change, alter, or in any way edit any possible DNA that's present? No. The serological analysis, does that, is that the determination if there's a DNA profile there or not, or is that a secondary step? That is a secondary step. Okay, so once you've performed uh, the identification and search for a biological fluid, let's just use this pen, you will <coughs> this pen, you would perform serological analysis, you get your results, your conclusions, then what, then what happens? Um, then we take that particular um, swab, if, for instance, if we saw the pen on for uh, DNA analysis. All right. When you're performing both your serological analysis and your DNA analysis, uh, where is that conducted in the lab? Um, that is conducted at our own uh, personal uh, base or our own personal areas for serological analysis. Um, we also have uh, a community area that we have for our larger instruments that we perform DNA analysis. And what are the measures that you take in order to uh, prevent any cross-contamination or uh, preventing biological fluid from going from one object to another? We wear personal protective equipment, uh, which include uh, goggles, face masks, hair nets, lab coats, gloves, we only work on one item of evidence at a time. Um, we also bleach down our areas between each item of evidence to prevent any type of cross-contamination. Is there an extensive protocol in place to ensure that cross-contamination and evidence destruction? Yes. Once you have, you told us, once you have taken the item, let's, and we're going to use a hypothetical, uh, as we have in this case, we have some items of clothing and either swab or taking a cutting, you said it's placed in a secure facility, those swabs or cuttings? Yes. And what is that secure facility called where, and where is it located? Um, that secure facility is, um, it's actually a, in the forensic biology unit, it's secure. Each uh, analyst has key card access to that area and uh, no one else has access to that, that particular area in the current laboratory. 
And I asked a poor question. I had uh, <coughs> actual serological items. Are they placed in what's called a serobag? Yes, they are placed in coin envelopes. Those coin envelopes are then placed into a serobag or serology bag, and that bag is sealed. <coughs> Those items of evidence, if there is a lead investigator or a lead detective, does that lead detective, because he's the lead, have access to that other facility? Objection, lead it. Go rule. No. Once you've performed a serological analysis uh, and you're going to take the items on for DNA analysis, uh, does, that occur in this, does that occur in the same facility? Yes. And before we, before I ask you about your analysis, explain to the members of the jury first what is DNA. DNA is what makes you unique to any other individual in the world. Uh, you get half of your DNA from your mother and half of your DNA from your father. It can tell you anything from your hair color, eye color, how tall you are, how short you are. And everyone in the world has a different DNA profile with the exception of identical siblings. And where is DNA found in the body? How is it deposited or, or how is it detected? DNA is found in any nucleated cell in your body. Uh, your DNA profile is the same whether it's found in hair, blood, semen, saliva, tissues, organs, skin cells, anywhere within your body. So, so this, the same skin cells as the same blood cells, semen, uh, all the nucleated cells, is it the same DNA profile throughout the body? Yes. And how is it that uh, that DNA profile uh, can be deposited or left behind a secondary surface and then uh, collected for evidence? Um, DNA can be uh, swabbed. Um, the entire item can be submitted to the crime laboratory where we can swab it and then perform DNA analysis on that item. Um, but it, can it be left behind uh, by touching an item? Yes, it can be left behind by touch. What are the factors involved in whether or not, I should strike that, let me rephrase, every time a person touches an item, whether it's this podium, this microphone, this pen, can you say that a DNA profile is always left behind on the item? Uh, no, it is not always. It depends on a number of different factors. And outline those factors for the, for the jury, please. Uh, it could depend on how long a person came into contact with the item. If you are in contact with an item for a longer amount of time, you can shed more skin cells on that item. It could depend on the surface of the item. Um, rougher surfaces, um, tend to, um, you can shed more DNA touch cells on rougher surfaces than on smooth surfaces. It could depend on uh, the person themselves. Some people just naturally shed their DNA more than other individuals. Um, it could depend on if the DNA was uh, wiped away with a certain item, uh, heat can degrade DNA. DNA can be washed away by um, any type of liquid substance. So there's no definitive other than swapping an item, performing a serological analysis, and then actually performing a DNA analysis. There's no way to determine, even if I've been holding this pen all week, whether or not I've left any DNA, to, uh, touch DNA on this item. Correct. Right. If you could explain to the members of the jury just the nature of touch DNA and uh, the concentration of DNA profiles in touch DNA versus other types of DNA, say blood. There's uh, much more DNA in liquid biological samples, such as um, blood. It's very DNA rich uh, versus uh, a touch item of evidence or leaving skin cells behind. There's not much DNA um, in that sample. And can the presence of blood, uh, hypothetically, if one were to touch the pen and then now the pen is coated in blood or has, or has blood on it, can the presence of blood uh, mask or drown out the presence of touch DNA? Yes. And why is that? Uh, because there is so much DNA in blood. It's very rich um, and we need a a certain number of cells to be able to detect DNA. And since blood is very rich in DNA, it can mask um, touch excuse me, cells. Uh, we've heard some testimony about swabbing of the inside of the mouth. Is that a, a common practice in order to attain what's called a DNA standard? Yes. And what is a DNA standard? A DNA standard is um, swabs that come from a known individual. So is it the actual saliva that's, that processes the DNA, or is it the skin cells from the cheek? It's the skin cells from the cheek. When you receive a DNA standard, you're not looking for a biological sample, correct? Correct. What do you do with the DNA standard when it comes into the lab? Uh, we 
inform DNA analysis on that, and there are four steps um, to the DNA process that we have in the lab to be able to obtain a DNA profile. Um, do you preserve that sample? In other words, uh, is there a pres preservation process? You, you know where the sample came from. You're not looking for a biological source. Uh, how do you preserve that sample, and where does that standard go? Um, that standard is preserved inside of our corn envelopes that do go into the serology bag that is then sealed, and it waits for um, the DNA analyst um, to perform DNA analysis on that particular sample. So now if you would please just tell us about the DNA analysis process, how it's, give us a brief uh, explanation of how it works and what you're actually looking to compare. So we have four uh, basic steps in the DNA process. The first step is called extraction, and this is where we take that sample or that swab and we extract or we purify the DNA. We break the cell open and we get inside and purify the DNA. The second step is called quantification, and this answers two different questions. Uh, the first question is, is there any DNA in the sample at all, any human DNA? Our tests are specific um, to humans. The second question that it answers is, how much DNA is there in the sample? Because we need to um, have so much DNA in the sample so that we, we are able to detect it. The third step is called amplification, and we can't see one tiny piece of DNA, so we have to replicate it multiple, multiple times. Um, this is amplification. The third step is called allele detection, and this is where we can actually visualize a DNA profile, either on paper or on a computer screen, and a DNA profile is basically a series of numbers. Any of the steps that you've outlined for us, uh, does that, uh, those steps alter, edit, destroy, damage any of the potential DNA profiles in a sample? No. And do you have uh, both positive and negative controls that you use within the DNA uh, analysis process that indicate to you when there may be a problem uh, with the running of the sample? Yes. How do those work? With our negative controls, we run those uh, through the um, actual DNA process. Um, at the end of the fourth step, our negative controls should not have any DNA uh, present in them. They should be blank or negative. Um, the positive controls, we know what that DNA profile should look like, um, and we know that it is a single source profile, meaning coming from one individual. So at the end of the DNA process, we know what our expected DNA profile is, and that's what um, the outcome should be. The, you told us about some factors that can inhibit or prevent DNA from being transferred. Are there factors that may prohibit or DNA from being able to be detected from an item? Yes, there are. Okay. And I want to ask you about passage of time. Uh, does the passage of time change or alter somebody's DNA profile? No. Uh, could the passage of time, uh, could the DNA degrade on a particular item uh, so that it may not be as strong over the passage of time? Yes. Do you have measures within the lab that even with the passage of time that allow you to amplify the profile so that it's uh, possible to be analyzed. Yes. And specifically within the, rep, um, I think you call it the amplification process, step three, where you make copies of the DNA in the profile? Correct. Are there measures in place to ensure essentially that there's no mix up on the copies? In other words, uh, there's, you know, one copy is not different from another? Yes. Is that part of your either positive or negative controls? Uh, we do have positive and negative controls, and each of the samples are contained within their own particular um, well or their own section um, when we're running the samples. If there is a problem with the running of the DNA sample, what is the practice protocol within your lab? Uh, do you run the sample again? Do you uh, tell us what you do? If there is a problem, we contact our technical leader. Um, we have to do a root cause analysis to see um, what the problem was and where it came from. Um, and we will start from the beginning with the samples and, and redo the four steps of the DNA process. Is there a, I want to say a limit, but is there a, a preferred number of requests uh, sort of for initial, uh, initial um, analysis that the DNA lab uh, limits. In other words, can a detective request just run everything? 
No, we do have a case submission policy. And uh, for um, and what, why is there a case submission policy? Uh, we had an extensive backlog, and um, we needed to cut down on our backlog. So we wanted the requester to limit the number of items to pick uh, what they thought were the most important items in their case to test. Uh, for DNA analysis, we can always go back and test more items for a second round or a third round, but we needed to triage the number of items that are tested in the first round. And the lab uh, that you work for, that works DNA for uh, all types of crimes within Palm Beach County, correct? Yes. In other words, it's not just homicides, it's sex crimes, it's property crimes, correct? Yes, we do outsource our property crimes, but any other type of crime, we do work in-house. When you work a case and you carry uh, samples from serology to DNA analysis, do you often report this to your findings? Yes. And in this case that we're here to discuss today, PBSO case number 16153089, did you have the opportunity to analyze uh, some items from a case involving your friend at Melanie? Yes. When you work uh, items of evidence, do you interview witnesses, meet with witnesses, um, or become intimately involved in the case facts? No. And what's the purpose that you don't do that? Um, we do have an evidence coordinator, and the case requests go to her. Um, she discusses with the requester what needs to be tested, and I get that information uh, from her. So you're not making a determination based on the case facts, what items need to be tested, those have to be requested, correct? Yes. Are you available for consult, however, if the detective wants to ask you what do you think about these items, are you available to consult with the detectives or other parties in determining what you think the best items would be? Yes. So let me ask you now, uh, did you have the opportunity again to test uh, a number of items in the case number 16153089, um, and could you please tell the members of the jury what submission numbers that you have, and if you need to reference your report, that's okay. Yes, I was. Um, submission 9, it's 2 plus standards from James Barry. Do you like to know the submissions that I tested? No, I'd like to know all the submissions that you have, and then we'll, we'll get to the submissions that you actually performed the testing on. Okay, submission 14A was the swab of a steering wheel. Uh, submission 14B, swab of gear shift. 14C, a section of front passenger seat. 14D, a swab of the front driver door interior. 14E, swab of the front driver's door interior armrest. 14F, a swab of the driver's front interior door frame. 14G, a swab of the emergency brake and center area. And submission 15 was a long sleeve shirt. So let me ask you first about submission 9 and part of submission 14, I believe you said 14B and 14D. Is that correct? 14B and 14F. 14B and uh, I'm going to bring the submissions to you and we'll, we'll look at them up there. But let's look at uh, submission number nine. And when you say submission, what, what, where is the submission number coming from? Um, from our laboratory information management system, when I was the evidence uh, coming to the crime laboratory, then they're assigned a submission number. Okay. And that submission number is printed on the item of evidence itself? Yes. How does the submission number allow you to, again, perform quality control on particular items of evidence within the lab to ensure that you know where they go and you handle them? Um, the submission numbers uh, follow that one item of evidence from the time that it comes into the crime laboratory um, all throughout the case. Is there a, a barcode as well as a case number as well as submission number on each one of these stairs? Yes. Is that what we see here? Yes. Does it contain a uh, brief description of what's in the bag? Yes. Objection leading forward. 
correct me, I think you said we have submission nine. And then submission 14B and 14F. Yes. All right. I'll leave those items for review and ask you do you recognize first states 14, I'm sorry, this is going to be states 96, submission number nine? Yes. And what is submission number nine? Two blood standards from James Mayer. And with respect to submission number, this is going to be 14B. Do you recognize submission 14B? Yes. And what is the submission 14B? Swallow the gearship. And finally, is submission 14F. Do you recognize 14F? Yes. What is 14F? Swallow the driver, front interior door frame. Now, to be clear, you didn't actually swab or photograph or see the vehicle where these swabs were taken from, correct? Correct. Let's start with submission 14B. Did you perform a serological analysis, or was a serological analysis performed on submission 14B? Yes. And were there any results or conclusions of that serological analysis uh, that were determined, again, uh, to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes. And what were those? Blood was confirmed. So the confirmatory test for blood, uh, the test was performed as you described for us, and the swab of the gear shift uh, did contain blood? Yes. When you say it contains blood, um, Again, you're not saying whose blood that is, correct? Correct. Until you take it on for DNA analysis. Correct. And did you do that with respect to submission 14B? Yes. Were you able to obtain a DNA profile or DNA profiles from submission 14B? Yes. And were you able to come to any conclusions uh, with respect to any profiles that were found on the swabs of the gear shift in states, in, uh, sorry, not states 14B, in submission 14B. Yes. Can you please tell the jury what results uh, you came to based on your analysis? 14B, the swabs from the gear shift, it was a mixture of two individuals. Uh, James Berry was included as a contributor, and then I performed a statistical weight for that inclusion. And what, what does that mean, you performed a statistical analysis to give a statistical weight? Um, in DNA analysis, um, for an inclusion, I perform a statistic called a likelihood ratio. So basically, the statistic tells you how likely one event is versus another event. So... With respect to the two events, what are the two events you say gives a, a likelihood of one event versus another event? What are the two events? Um, in this particular case, um, the two events that I compared is if it was James Berry and an unknown individual in the population versus if it's two unknown individuals in the population. So essentially it is the likelihood that James Berry is present in that blood versus the hypothetical where James Berry is not present and it's just two people picked at random. Yes. All right. And what was the likelihood of the first hypothesis that James Berry was the contributor to that blood? It was 852 quintillion times more likely that he is a contributor. Uh, it's him and an unknown individual versus it's two other individuals. All right. And the, do, do you also have a statistical weight to, you said there were two um, DNA profiles, correct? Yes, it was a mixture of two individuals. With respect to the mixture itself, do you have, do you, are you able to give uh, some type of statistical weight to the amount of one profile versus the amount of the second profile? Yes. And can you tell us about that with respect to submission 14B? James Berry contributed to 88% of that DNA mixture. So James Berry included many quintillions more times likely than James Berry not being there, and he contributed to 90% of the sample that was confirmed as blood on the gear shift in 14B. 
Approximately. Yes. Okay. So let's look now at the second swabs that you analyzed from the vehicle submission 14F. Same question. Did you perform DNA analysis on swabs 14F driver's front interior door frame? Yes. And did you come to any conclusion to, the, to a degree of scientific certainty, a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, uh, when you performed your DNA analysis? Yes. Uh, did you locate any DNA profiles? Yes. How many profiles were present in the submission 14F? Um, there was one contributor, meaning that was a single source profile. Okay, so as opposed to a mixture on the gear shift, this was a single source profile? Yes. And did you, before you took it on to DNA analysis, did you perform a serological analysis? Serological testing was conducted. Uh, what were the results of the serological testing? <laughs> blood was confirmed. So this is a confirmed sample of blood of 14 f and you say it's a single source profile, correct? Correct. Did you come to any conclusions with respect to the identity of that single source profile? Yes. And if you could please state your conclusions to put the jury. Jones Berry was included as a contributor. And did you, were you able to do, as you stated before, uh, give statistical weight to that finding? Yes. What was the statistical weight that you uh, concluded? Approximately 425 octillion times more likely that it is James Berry than it is not James Berry. Octillion, is that greater than quintillion? Yes. And is this a <coughs> is this a likelihood ratio as well because it's a single source profile? It is. <coughs> what is the likelihood, or what are the two hypotheses that you are, I guess, testing if it's a likelihood ratio with a single source profile? Um, the fact that it is James Berry versus it is not James Berry. And octillion, that's beyond billion, beyond trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, yes. septillion, sextillion, now octillion? Yes. The, are you aware of the most recent uh, census of the population of every person on the planet? Yes, it is approximately seven billion people. Billion, not million, right? Correct. Now, finally, look at states 143. This is going to be submission 15, and I think you have the nomenclature as 15A4. Is that correct? Yes. What is what is 15A4? 15A is for a long sleep shirt. Now, unlike the swabs that were taken not by yourself from the vehicle. What item did you receive in evidence uh, with respect to submission 15? Or did you receive swabs? Or were swabs entered into evidence for analysis? No. What was the, the item that was tested for serology and then for the analysis? Um, a cutting of the right cuff of the long sleeve shirt. And why would a cutting be used? Uh, as opposed to a swab and dealing with uh, an item of uh, uh, clothing item? Um, I don't know it could be used, but um, usually with clothing, clothing uh, blood will embed into that item, so instead of swabbing the surface uh, blood stain, if we take a cutting, we may get cutting more DNA. Now, the cutting itself, that's not contained in the bag that's item, that's marked as item uh, 143 is submission 15, correct? Correct. Where would that cutting be now? It is on the right cuff as board. Um, actually, let me rephrase the question, it was a poor question. The actual cutting now, uh, we have the swabs, where's the actual cutting at? The cutting is in the forensic biology unit in the secured um, bag. Um, but the hole where the cutting was taken on the on the actual shirt, we can actually see the hole where it's taken, correct? Yes. Do you know, strike that, did you come into contact with a person?
person who wore that shirt? No. Did you rephrase, was a serological analysis performed on the cutting from the shirt that's labeled submission 14? I'm sorry, submission 15. Yes. Were there any results of that serological analysis? Yes. And what were the results? Blood was confirmed. And at that point, was the sample from the cutting taken on, taken on for DNA analysis? Yes. Did you come to any conclusions to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty um, based on your DNA analysis of that cutting? Yes. Was a DNA profile or DNA profiles located? Yes. How many profiles were present? Um, this was a mixture of two individuals. Were you able to perform a uh, contributor ratio? And that's the ratio of, like, I guess, one profile to another uh, with respect to the blood on the shirt? Yes. What was the contributor ratio? Uh, Contributor 1 contributed 96%, um, and Contributor 1 was James Berry. Right, so, confirmed for blood, the contributor ratio is 96% of the DNA from that uh, blood sample is James Berry. Yes. And did you also perform a likelihood ratio um, and give statistical weight to your findings that James Berry was 96% of contributor number one. Yes. What were the results of your statistical weight? It was 197 octillion times more likely that it was that it was James Berry and an unknown contributor than is two unknown contributors in the population. So you have, again, our two hy hypotheses, James Berry and a random person, or two random people. Yes. And I think you said, is this an octillion as well? It is. Octillion times more likely that James Berry, 96% the contributor at that blood stain than, than not, correct? Yes. I have further questions for the witness. Cross examination. Good morning. Good morning. So to summarize, all these items had James Barry's blood on them, correct? Correct. Right. And most of them had somebody else's DNA as well, correct? Correct. Did you analyze the someone else's DNA? Uh, James Barry was the only uh, standard that I had to compare. Um, who decided what you get to work on? Um, an evidence request form is put in by the detective um, to our evidence coordinator. So it's the detective who decides what you analyze, correct? Um, yes, they, they make the request. Have you ever contacted the detective and said, oh, I also need this and that to analyze? Yes. They usually comply? Yes. Judge, if I could ask the clerk for Exhibit 127 and 78 and 79, please. And may I approach you? You may approach. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. I have absolutely no discussion to have with you about the presence of James Barry's blood. Uh, on these items. But my question to you goes to the unknown. Um, I'm going to approach you with States Exhibit, if I may approach, you. approach. States Exhibit 127. Do you know what that is? It says two swaps, oral standard, um, white male by hand. Did you ever open that? No. How do you know? There is no evidence still with my initials or date on it. Uh, did you ever analyze it? No. 
If you had been given that, could you have analyzed and told whether Guy Han's DNA was the, quote, unknown? With the two, two mixtures that I obtained, I was not able to make any comparisons to that second contributor. There was not enough DNA present. So with any additional standards, I would not have been able to compare to that second person. Forgive me, I did not understand. If you had the DNA of Guy Hand, you could have run it and come up with a profile, correct? Yes. And could you have compared that profile to the unknown 4% and 12%? No, I could not have. I deemed when I looked at the DNA profile, that second contributor did not have enough DNA present for me to compare to. So that second contributor was inconclusive. Even if you had had uh, a DNA profile for someone that was complete, you could not have said what the percentage was that that was the unknown? There's a percentage listed, but I would not have been able to make any inclusions or exclusions. Okay. So would it be accurate to state that you know that James Berry's blood was in those items, but you don't know how it got there? I do not know how it got there. If I may display for the jury exhibit 143. <laughs> to find or see blood on, I won't touch it, but don't worry, blood on here? I'm not with the lighting, not with my naked eye, I don't, I don't see anything right now. Uh, if this was soaked in blood, you could see that? Um, usually if it's soaked in blood, I can see it. So, Does this blouse have any relevance in this case that you're aware of? Objection beyond the scope. Suspended. If I give you a set of gloves, would you be able to tell me if you see any other blood stains besides the small cutout, which I assume had one? The items already tested for blood in our laboratory, and those results were uh, documented. I understand. I give you a pair of gloves on this, and you point out a blood stain. Uh, the blood stain that was confirmed on the shirt uh, is in our laboratory, so that would be the only one. Are you saying that that is the only blood stain on the shirt? That was the only one that was detected, the only one that was confirmed. I'm going to show you what have been marked or entered into evidence as states 78 and 79. May I approach you? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You see these bloody hands? I see a reddish discoloration on the hands. May I approach the witness? Yes. Yeah. You see a better view of bloody hands? Here, it's just a I can't call it blood. Assuming that it's blood, could you have analyzed it? Did I analyze it? Could you have analyzed it? Yes. So assuming it was blood, well, explain please what multiple donors are. Multiple donors would be a mixture of individuals. So you're able to detect 
multiple donors? In certain instances, yes. And so, let's just say hypothetically there's a bloody hand. You could tell me how much of that blood was from one human being and how much of that blood was from another human being? After performing DNA analysis, I could give you a contributor ratio. Okay. And you could tell me if you had a known sample, like the one sitting next to you from Guy Han, whether he was more likely than not one of the donors? Oh, yes. If there was enough DNA present, yes. You were not given a sample in what was submitted by the detective of anything pertaining to Guy Han, were you? No. And you never again analyzed the sample of DNA from Guy Han? No. So would it be accurate to completely sum up your testimony that one dot on the blouse worn by the alleged attacker had Guy Han, Guy, sorry, James Barry's blood, and various areas in her car had blood originating from James Barry? Yes. And that's the totality of what your tests show? Yes. And that there was some other DNA involved, but you have no idea whose? Correct. That was incomplete. And further testing could have been done, but was not submitted? Correct. I've got no further questions. Thank you. Redirect. Yes, Judge. So without, in other words, without the scientific analysis that you do, you don't assume that it's blood until you've actually tested it, correct? Correct. And is the, can the same be said with respect to the shirt, you test items to see if there's blood there, not simply just look at them? Correct. Um, with respect to somebody's hand, if there's blood-like stain on them, if, even if there were to be blood, say on, on the hand of a person, swab that area, could you also obtain touch DNA from that person's skin cells on their hand mixed in with the blood? Yes. And if that person were bleeding, the blood and the skin cells would have the same DNA profile as that person, correct? Yes. And in that case, there would be no difference in contributor ratio, would there be? If it were single source? Correct. Because all the DNA in the person is the same, correct? Yes. You stated in counsel's questioning that with respect to the items taken from the gear shift swabs and the shirt, with respect to the minor contributors, the 12% and the 4%, there was not enough DNA present to compare if you were, to, even if you were to have a secondary um, known standard? That's correct. Just, I guess, tell us a little bit more about those minor contributors. Was, was there just not enough DNA present? There was not enough DNA present um, to make any type of inclusions or exclusions, so I deem the minor contributor inconclusive. And would that be, would that type of situation where you have an 88% contributor ratio to 12% um, and a 96 to 4%, would that be consistent with the two samples originating from 
blood being the higher contributor ratio, and then some possible touch DNA being contributor to the lower ratio. Objection, speculative. Over. Yes. And that would be consistent with, the, with that hypothesis? Yes. So in a hypothetical, if the wearer of that shirt were to get some of their touch DNA, their skin DNA, on the cup, would it be consistent with your findings that James Berry's blood is on that shirt and then the minor contributor is the person wearing the shirt? That could be. Would it be consistent with your findings with respect to the DNA profile in the gear shift if the, a person had the blood of James Berry on their hands and touched the gear shift? and left some of their skin cells on the gear shift and that contributed to the minor profile? Yes. And from what you told us before about touching blood, the touching blood on the hand of a person, if the person touching the gear shift is the same blood, would you get any difference in contributor ratio? No. It would be a single source profile, correct? Correct. No further questions. All right, Ms. Anderson, you may step down. Thank stipulation of counsel to states 150A, this is already in evidence, that the identification of this person uh, contained in states 150A, medical examiner number 161798 is in fact James Barry. Stipulation of memory? All right. The memory has been stipulated. One moment, Your Honor. Yes. State rest. All right, members of the jury, I'm going to ask you to step into the jury room for just one moment. We'll bring you out just as quickly as we can. Counsel, if you see that, let me hear any defense motions, and then we'll plan the rest of the schedule. Your Honor, at this time, I would move the court for a judgment of acquittal. I would also reiterate all prior motions, most specifically the motion to suppress the confession, but would also reiterate all prior motions and all prior objections and all motions to exclude or limit, including the text messages. My motion for judgment of acquittal is the state has not proven every element of this crime, not uh, not even bare bones prima facie. Um, they have proven that the young lady who was in the home had the deceased blood on her, and they have also um, played a confession which, um, in which the detective plants words, and uh, it does not amount to a confession of this crime. Okay. Um, I don't think you have to renew your objections and motions. I think those are preserved. They do have to rule on the judgment of the quill. State has made a prima facie case. I'm going to deny the motion. You can't answer questions. you, just that are safe. I'm sorry. True. All right. Um, I'm denying the motion for judgment of the quill. The state's made a prima facie case. Um, other than your client, do you have any witnesses you wish to call? No, sir. Okay. Is it appropriate at this time to have a colloquy with your client concerned whether to testify or not testify? Yes, I have. One second. You want me to step off? And no. One right. second. Ready. Okay. Truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, okay, you may 
put your hand down. Would you again please state your name for me? Ms. Ian, I'm going to have a conversation with you about your right to testify or not testify in this case. My purpose in having this conversation with you is to first make sure that you understand your rights and then secondly to make sure that you're exercising those rights for yourself. So I'm going to start with your rights and explain them to you. Uh, in this case, you have the right to take the witness stand and testify in your defense, uh, as all of the witnesses have testified in this case. Or you also have the right to remain silent. And should you choose to exercise that right to remain silent, this jury is not permitted to infer guilt from that or use it in any way. So the first question I have for you is, do you understand in this case that you have both the right to testify or not testify? Do you understand that? Yes, sir. All right. Now, there are certain decisions your attorney gets to make for you. We call those strategic decisions. However, there are certain other decisions which we call fundamental decisions, which you have to make for yourself. Whether to testify or not testify in a case is what we describe as a fundamental decision, which means you have to decide that for yourself. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. Now, do not tell me what you spoke to your attorney about. That is privileged. I'm not entitled to know what you spoke specifically with your attorney about. But I do want to make sure that you've at least had the opportunity, the chance, to speak with your attorney to make to understand your rights about testifying or not testifying in the case and to discuss with your attorney whether you should testify. Have you had a chance to speak with your attorney about that? And for yourself, have you made a decision in this case about whether you wish to testify or not? You, I'm sorry? Uh, yes. You've made a decision. Okay. And what is that decision, ma'am? Um, the decision is not to testify. All right. So you're exercising your right to remain silent. Very good. You have an absolute right under our Constitution to do that. And we will instruct, or I will instruct the jury that that cannot be used in any way. Thank you. All right, I assume what that means then is that when uh, the jury comes back out, I'll give you an opportunity to be present in the presence of the jury, and we'll be ready to proceed uh, with legal instructions and in closing. So let's talk scheduling here a little bit. Um, it's about it's 25. All right. Um, how long are the parties requesting for closing? One hour. One hour. Defense? 30 minutes. You're going to get equal time no matter what. So an hour. All right, you're asking for an hour. Um, how do you want to break up your time? 30 and 30. 30 and 30, and where do you want your warnings? Uh, can I give my warnings? I can. I'll give my warnings to Madam Clerk, I need to look at my notes. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Where do you want your warnings? Okay. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. All right, let's talk logistics then. Um, obviously, I can't, I cannot go two hours and uh, not allow them to eat. What I can do um, is we can take a break. Um, well, we got a couple options. Did you get menus this morning? No. All right. Um, we've got a couple of options. We can go ahead. We probably will not with the instructions. We could do the jury instructions and do the state's primary closing and then break for lunch and come back and allow the defense to do their closing and then do the rebuttal closing. Um, we can do that in one of two ways. I can send them out for lunch or I can buy them lunch and we can take a shorter lunch and just bring them back. Um, that's one way we can handle it. Um, I kind of hate to send them out for lunch this early. It's kind of early at this time to send them out for lunch. So I'd like to get some of the closings uh, started. Any preference from the parties? Yes, Your Honor. I'd strongly object to having them sit and eat or walk or whatever it is they would do after just hearing uh, one side's argument. So I would ask... hear your side when they come back. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, State. I, I have no objection to it. Whatever God wants to do. I, I don't think there's any prejudice by... Uh, I split closings um, before. I don't think there's any issue there. Um, what, I think I always instruct them, even though they've heard um, portion of the closings, they're not permitted yet to discuss the case. So I've never had an issue there. Um, the question becomes whether we go ahead and why don't we order them lunch um, and then I'll instruct them we'll do the primary and hopefully lunch will be here by the time that we're ready. You're 
first closing is 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. How would we do this? Um, why don't we give them that? It might be easier just to give them an early, because if I can't get the lunch back here for an hour, we're gonna, I'm not going to force the fence to split their closing. They're going to want to do their closing um, consistently all the way through. Perhaps the best thing to do is to do an early lunch and then just do it all after lunch. Then it's probably the best way to do it, given the fact that we can't get a lunch here you know, for, for an hour. Um, what I am going to do is bring them out. I'm going to allow you to rest in the presence of the jury. I'm going to tell them that we're, we're going to take an early lunch for them. Well, I'm back in an hour and I'm back at, uh, at 1230. Um, and at that time, they'll get their legal instructions and closing arguments. And we'll that way. I'll remind them they cannot discuss the case, even though all the evidence. All right, so once you bring the jury out, I'll let you rest and I'll give them instructions. At some point, I'll make the second JOM. Um, as soon as they leave, make the second JOM. Because um, you're going to rest anyway, I'll do the second JOM. Jury Andrew. Welcome back, members of the jury. State has rested. Any evidence or testimony the defense wishes to present at this time? No, Your Honor. At this point, the defense rests. Defense rests. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, both the state and the defense have rested their case, which means all of the evidence is in. Um, logistically, what we're going to do, because we don't want to break up the continuity of the closing arguments and the legal instructions that you're going to receive, so we're actually going to, because of the hour, we'll break a little bit early for lunch. When you come back from lunch, I'm going to give you legal instructions, and the attorneys will make their closing arguments to you. I'm going to give you just a couple minutes over an hour. I'm going to ask you to be back at 12.30 if that's okay. Um, so we'll let you go now, and you'll come back at 12.30. Let me caution you, even though all the evidence is now in the case, you've not heard the closing arguments by the attorneys, and you do not yet know the law that you must follow in this case. So you cannot discuss, even at this time, while the evidence is in, the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. So all those rules still apply. You cannot discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. You can't do any research, and you cannot listen to or read the news and counsel the trial. So at this time, we're going to release you a little bit early for lunch. We'll see you back at 12.30, and we'll have your legal instructions. Counsel, if you see that if you want to go ahead and renew now your motion for adjustment of acquittal of the higher standard. Your Honor, at this point, the defense moves for judgment of acquittal. Um, Your Honor is aware of the standard. I don't think that the state met it. I also renew all prior motions and forgive me objections. And, um, and that's our position. Okay, let me just briefly respond to the state since we're dealing with the higher standard on the final page. Just to summarize your position with respect to the Your Honor, the state has proven um, all three elements of second degree murder with the weapon from the scene based on both her statement as well as her flight as well as all the testimony the fact that she her evidence was located there she's also found in possession both on her person via her shirt as well as her car the defendant uh, the deceased James Berry's DNA the evidence um, in this case certainly satisfies the second um, judgment of acquittal. Is there anything further? No, sir. Okay. Uh, motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. State has met heard. Um, okay, so uh, you guys take an hour. I've got the jury instructions pretty much prepared already. I'll have the copies ready when you come back. I'll instruct the jury. Um, as you, well, maybe, maybe Ms. Blair doesn't know. I instruct the jury first before the closing. 90% uh, anyway. Everything but the final instructions I'm going to give them before the closing. All right, so an hour apiece, 30-30, uh, and you can, Samantha, are you going to be here for the closings? Uh, yes, sir. Well, just if you're not, if it's going to be Alice, just make sure you're going to notice so we know what's going on. Okay, I'll see you guys back in the morning.